Major funding for this special Frontline series is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Tonight, a Frontline special series of portraits of the people of the Soviet Union. It's harvest time at the October Collective Farm in the Soviet Union. These people support the collective, and it supports them. They work for the state and for themselves, for profit as well as politics. Tonight, October Harvest. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTBS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is a special Frontline series with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Tonight we continue our 12-part series on people who live in the Soviet Union. Comrades is the name of the series. It was made by a team of producers from the British Broadcasting Corporation who spent two years in the Soviet Union. They were granted access almost never before given a Western film crew. Frontline is bringing this series to the United States because it offers a rare look at the lifestyles of some Soviet citizens, people about whom we know very little. And when we do hear about them and their tightly controlled society, it's usually in news reports that deal with what is out of the ordinary. Comrades deals with the everyday. It's a series of portraits of Soviet citizens. Tonight, we travel to southern Russia to meet the Kulinich family, who live and work on a collective farm. The program is called October Harvest. And at the end, I'll be back to talk to the producer about how it was made and with experts to learn more about the Soviet agricultural system. The program is narrated by series producer Richard Denton. <laughs> a.m. A summer's day begins for the Kulinich family, who live on a collective farm in southern Russia. Grain harvest is at its height, but though it's the busiest time of the year in the farm's collective fields, for the Kuliniches, the first priority of the day is their animals, which they own and rear privately. <laughs> Undisputed head of the family is Maria Kulinich, known to everyone as Babushka, Granny. She's 78 and has lived here all her life. I had a lot of family. I had nine babies. All my life I worked. I didn't only when I was a child, but when I grew up, I worked. I worked on the collective farm. But then my children died. Six of the souls passed away. 
Only three were left, so it's them I live with now. We all worked. They were young and they obeyed me. When their father was alive, they obeyed him too. They used to go to the steppe. The little ones, they tended the herd, they worked beside their father in the fields. Maria and her three surviving sons, now all in their forties, live in neighboring houses at the heart of the farm's territory. Her oldest son is Victor. There are three of us, brothers. We've grown up and married. When the first of us got married, we built a house for him. Then, as each one got married, we built him a house, too. We built them after father died. We had our own money. Father didn't leave any money, so we did it all with our own hands. I started living with the youngest son. Well, we all lived together at first. Then the others moved into their houses and we stayed in the old one. There was an old house we used to live in, but then we built a new house and tore the old one down, and that's where we live now. Slava is the youngest, most important. He drives a combine harvester. Alexei is a bus driver. He must get the workers to the fields on time. Everyone understands it's a responsible job. A Soviet collective farm is more than just a farm. It's a whole community. Everyone belongs to it and everyone works for it, whatever their job. Victor, for instance, is a projectionist, but he works for the collective too. The only movie theater around here is owned by the farm. In the morning, He's the one with the time to feed the animals as the others leave for the fields. Slava's job as a combine harvester driver can earn him up to three times the average wage, plus bonuses. But the combine harvesters work long hours for their money. At harvest time, they're at the bus stop at dawn seven days a week and won't be brought home from the fields until after eight in the evening. Unlike most Russian farming areas, the land here in the south is rich and fertile. And with several different crops to harvest, these men can accumulate large amounts of cash. But just having money isn't enough. In a country so short of consumer goods, finding things to spend it on is the real problem. One that Maria finds difficult to understand, with her memories of civil war, famine, and World War II. Before the war, it wasn't that bad. We lived and worked. But during the war, I was left alone with four of the children. Those were bad times. There was a famine. I worked alone. They were so little. There was no bread. We milled grain ourselves to get flour. In four years, my old man was away at the war. So we lived. Somehow, I'd get up early, come home late, and find the kids at home on their own. We had a cow. I milked it to get milk for the kids. That's how we pulled through. In wartime, we suffered a lot. It wasn't too bad before, but the war was dreadful. All those armies passed through our settlement here. Soldiers eating what little food we had. They were also hungry, you see. But there wasn't any food to cook. Then my old man came back from the war and worked here as a dairy manager. He was at the dairy depot with the cows. 
Maya Scotta. This is the October farm, named after the month when the Russian Revolution took place. It's larger than average size for a collective farm, about 40 square miles of land and 11,000 peasants. Slava's bus ride to the combine harvest yard out in the fields takes about 20 minutes. At the moment, it's his only way of getting there, though not for long. 18 months ago, he bought a car, his first. But like most Soviet motorists, he's had to wait for delivery. It should be arriving any day, but when it does, he'll be one of the few people on the farm to own one. This is a fertile region, so all the farms around here are relatively productive. But the October farm is by no means a showpiece. As the farm director told us, we've no Lenin prizes and too little topsoil. But the peasants here are lucky. The sun shines and the rain falls in just the right amounts to give good harvests. Elsewhere, many Russian farms suffer from drought or barren soil or poor management. Almost every year, the grain harvest is so inadequate that the Soviet Union has to import from abroad. And even when the harvest is good, distribution is poor. So each winter there are shortages and long lines in the cities. In 1917, within 24 hours of the revolution, all of the land was officially turned over to the peasants. After two major famines, private smallholders began to prosper. But by 1930, Stalin had decided that the Soviet Union must be turned into an industrial power. The new factory workers should be fed on grain produced by the peasants at a price fixed by the government. But the price was too low and too many peasants simply refused. Unable to force millions of small scattered households to obey him, Stalin reorganized them into these massive farms, often the size of whole villages. It was a chaotic and brutal process. Most of the peasants had to be coerced into joining the new collectives. Many preferred to slaughter their animals and burn their land. Many were killed for their defiance. Stalin's hammer was mightier than his sickle. 50 years later, it's a chapter of their history they prefer to forget. The farms now provide more than half the country's food. On each farm, the land and machines belong jointly to the whole community, which elects a chairman and a board of directors to manage its affairs. The farm sells its produce to the state at state prices, and everyone works to the state plan. The idealized targets of the plan are displayed in the streets, like Western advertisements, somewhat remote from reality. brothers are part of a new generation, so they see collectivization as the cause of their improved standard of living. Our generation can't imagine life outside the collective farm. What would private farming be like? What if they gave me land? How would I cultivate it? No, I don't know. A, a collective farm? Well, of course it's a good thing to do it all collectively. Period. Harvest time was always like that. If the weather is good, they'll work. But in the old days, it was different. Now they harvest quickly. They just started mowing, and here they've almost finished threshing. There's lots of machines now. Good for people to work, so harvest goes well. In my time, they couldn't work so fast. There weren't many machines. They had to work long hours. 
Before they finished, the snow would come. The frosts. But now they work really good. In two weeks, they do the lot and finish the whole harvest. The authorities know that ideology alone cannot keep the peasants' loyalty, so they've given them a stake in the farm's success. My wife works on the collective farm and receives grain. It, it's a benefit for working there. We farmers see it as a bonus. Part of our wages are paid in grain and sunflower oil. She gets the same produce as the others do. Food for a peasant household. That's what we need. Broken again. I'll fix it. Part of communism's strength is its ability to get involved in every last detail of day-to-day -day life. On the farm, nothing is overlooked. At the workshop where Slava's wife, Falia, sits and sews, made-to-measure dresses are sold at specially reduced prices. They'd cost three times as much in the shops. The message is clear. Support your local collective, and it'll support you. What does the farm mean for the village? The better the collective does, the more comfortably we'll all live. It was much harder for our parents uh, after the war devastation. They had so much work to do. Now we work less. Life's gotten better, much better. In the olden days, no peasant dreamed of owning a car. Now everybody, well, not everybody, but most of us have some sort of transportation, a car, a motorcycle, or a bicycle. The house is my personal property, and the land belongs to me. Well, it, it's not really mine. We rent the land, nominal rent, about uh, $30 a year. The, the state owns all the land. But if the land is attached to my house, it sort of belongs to me. It's an orchard and a vegetable garden. We grow vegetables for our daily needs. Tomatoes, cucumbers, carrots, onions, and garlic. As for the orchard, we've got apple trees, cherry trees, apricot trees. We grow them for our own everyday use. Animals? We raise pigs, chickens, and ducks, also for our own use. If there's any produce left over, we save it for winter, preserve it or pickle it. If we have any spare cucumbers or squash, we feed them to the pigs, we give them to the animals. Like most collective farmers, the Kuliniches sell their private produce at the local market. Here, Soviet free enterprise is alive and well, and efficient. Homegrown food accounts, quite legally, for about a third of all the meat, eggs, fruit and vegetables on sale anywhere in the Soviet Union. The peasants charge as much as they can get. Now, tomatoes here cost about two dollars a pound. That's much higher in the state shops, but at least you can be sure to get them. The extra cash is a vital incentive for the peasants. The state recognizes that and doesn't attempt to tax it. Midday, and for Slava, lunch in one of the farm's canteens. The food is free, and there's plenty of it. 
Free lunches are one of a whole variety of farm workers' special benefits. That's another reason why the peasants now accept without dissent a system which their fathers may have suffered terribly to resist. Apart from grain, the October farm's main crops are beetroot, cucumber, sunflowers and fruit. Every day, Alexei drives the afternoon shift to the orchards. The cherries, plums and grapes in this area are among Russia's finest. It's noticeable how the fruit pickers are all women. Officially, the sexes are treated equally in the Soviet Union. Down on the farm, though, the women are expected to work shorter hours to leave time for their other job, looking after the men. Alexei's son, Sidi Orja, plays for the farm's football team. In many areas, young people are leaving the land for the jobs, education and material pleasures available in the town. For Maria, who like most Soviet grandmothers brought up her children's children, it's a worrying thought. One granddaughter, four grandsons. I brought them all up myself. Everyone was building homes, everyone was busy working, and I looked after the children. I'd pick them up and carry them in my arms and under my arms and where not. I was bringing them up. I did it somehow. I want them all to be decent people and good workers. And uh, I hope they'll take care of their parents. That's our hope in getting older. I can't guarantee they'll stay here. It's up to them. They might stay, they might leave. No one's forcing them. All parents would like to live with their kids. But they have to make their own way. Perhaps they won't stay with us. They're growing up. My grandchildren are grown up. They're already working. I mean, the two oldest already work. The young ones will start work soon. What's left for Granny to do now? It's time for Granny to rest. My youngsters respect us older ones. What should I say? Well, they're not so bad. Everything's fine with them. They understand that some of us are getting on. Old age comes to everyone, not just me. Maria's only regret about young people is that they've abandoned the Christian faith that she grew up with. I'm a believer. There's a church. I do go there. Many women, the old ones, go there. Young people don't go anymore, but the old women do. We have icons, as we had since I was a little girl. And we still have them. It's not in my time it started, with our fathers and mothers. We have icons because we've always had them. And we still keep them. We're believers, as our forefathers believed, like them. 
So we also believe. It didn't start today or yesterday. We get our faith from our forefathers. I can't prove my faith. I'm illiterate. I can't read. Those who read understand, but I'm illiterate. I can't say what religion means. But officially, God is dead in the Soviet Union. In his place, there are new idols, new ethics, and new rituals of worship. Harvesting will continue until nightfall, but Slava has for once left his work to someone else. After 18 months, he's got the news he's been waiting for. His new car is ready for collection. So he and his brother Alexei have left the fields and gone into the nearest big town, Krasnodar, to pick it up. At home, Victor's thoughts turn to celebrating the big occasion. Although it will belong to Slava, the whole family will share the happiness and the freedom that a private car promises. On occasions like this, the Kuliniches are like farming people everywhere, neither sentimental nor squeamish. Have you lit the oven? Yes. Within the family, the skills and traditions of peasant life, the homemade recipes and handicrafts, are still thriving. It's nearly two hours since they've been gone. This is Moscow. Attention, this is the local radio center. Listen to the announcements. Today's movie is a new Indian feature film in color, Disco Dancer. Most people are already looking forward to knocking off by the time Victor finally starts work. Today, before the family celebration at home, he's showing a program of cartoons to children from the four kindergartens on the farm.
My father first took me to the movies. It was after the war, when films were shown outdoors. I remember my first film like it was yesterday. A country school teacher. I enjoyed it. afternoon. The brothers return with Alexei driving. Slava, the new owner, has one problem. He hasn't yet passed his driving test. We'd hinted that this was a moment we'd like to film, so perhaps our presence ensured that the car was delivered today. But the Kaliniches would have been delighted whatever day it had turned up. What a beauty. Did you choose it? We chose the one she liked. Come and look, do you like it? It'll soon be shining when it's washed. It's gray. Well, white. Sort of light beige. Okay, owner, drive it through the gate. The cheapest Soviet car costs about $5,600, and it's not noted for its reliability. So Slava chose the most expensive family car on the market, the Volga, with a price tag not far short of $21,000. To pay for it, he borrowed $7,000 from the farm. As a worker with long service, he's entitled to a low-interest loan. The rest he saved over several years. The Kaliniches spend little of their earnings. Most of what they need they either get from the collective or provide for themselves from their own private plots. Let's wash it down. We've got a drink to it. Come on, take a look. I'd rather stay here. Where's the radio? On the back seat. Will you try it out? Go on. Try it out for size. Hey, Granny. That's enough. Come on. That'll do for now. When you've got a car, it's great. Just great. You can go out any time without using public transport. To the seaside, anywhere. That's enough, Slava. Get out. Are you practicing? Later. Do it later. Stop posing in there. Let's go inside. Come on. The inspection is over. Now for the serious business of toasting the new arrival. Let's sit down, everyone. 
Let's wash it down. Just sit down, everyone. Shall I open the bottle? I can't wait all day for Slava. Granny, have a drop. Just water for me. To you, Slavic. Congratulations. Learn to drive and take us for a spin. Take Granny for a ride, too. Now that we start to live better, and we sure do, I'm getting old. You do want to live, but you're too old. Of course we live well. Do you think we live poorly? In my time, when I was young, we didn't live like they do now. If only I could live now, but I'm too old and ill. Death can't be far away. Bring up, don't get behind. <laughs> Let me want to work. <laughs> Who'll wash the car? That's the owner's job. <laughs> Not until after the harvesting. The drink up. We chose well, didn't we? One for the road. While one family celebrates, work in the fields goes on. And after the party, Slava himself returns to finish the day's harvesting. The routine of the collective farm is important to the Kulinishes. But with their flourishing private gardens, their backyard full of their own livestock, and a brand new car in the drive, they seem, like many Russian peasants, to be part of a new version of the communist way of life. Lenin with loopholes. That was October Harvest. It was produced by Alan Bookbinder, and he's here with me now. Alan, how did you pick the Kulinich family? What drew you to them? Well, we had told the Soviet authorities that we were very keen to set one of our, of our films on a collective farm. We weren't interested in making a film about agriculture, about farming as such, but about a particular family within the farm. And of all the farms we saw and of all the people we met on farms, we thought the Kuliniches would make the most interesting human story. We very much liked Maria, the grandmother, because she was such a, mm -hmm. uh, a colorful and revealing character who was quite open and willing to talk to us about all sorts of things. We liked the fact that the family was all living together and we could see three generations of people growing up on the farm. And we liked the variety of activities on the farming community that the brothers were involved in. So we thought overall they would present a very um, interesting, valuable picture. Did you have a choice of what region you were going to go to? Did they say you can pick or was this the only thing? They wanted us to go to the south and I think because it's a fertile area, because it shows a picture of, of Soviet farming that is more um, 
uh, well, positive mm -hmm. than the rest of, of the country, where Soviet agriculture is generally not in as good a shape as here. Mm -hmm. But you see, we weren't too concerned about this. We were quite happy to be guided to a, a fertile area because of the very fact that we weren't trying to make a rounded documentary about farming. We are much more interested in the human story, the family, okay. the religion, um, all these other elements that emerge. Any particular problems uh, filming here? It seemed fairly tranquil, but what did you run into? On the whole, the farm authorities were very willing to just let us be with the family, let us film whatever we wanted, whatever they did, we could go with them. There was just one thing that, that did come up that they were not happy about, and this was the church and the graveyard where Maria's husband was mm. uh, buried. She visited, him, visited the graveyard every day and we asked to go mm. along to film with her. And the farm authorities said, no, that wouldn't be possible. And I can only guess that the reason they weren't happy about this was that it was a Christian graveyard, there were crosses there. It would uh. show more really how important um, Christianity is to the community and they, they clearly didn't want to have that Didn't want you there presented. or in the church. For that matter, That's where she right. said she worshipped frequently. Also with me are two people considered experts on Soviet agriculture. First, Professor Elizabeth Clayton. She's a professor of economics at the University of Missouri at St. Louis. She is a specialist on Soviet agriculture. And John Crystal. He's an Iowa banker and farmer who has been advising the Soviets on agricultural issues from the days of Khrushchev. He has known Gorbachev since he was the Politburo member in charge of agriculture. And Mr. Crystal has been traveling to the Soviet Union for about 30 years. Just how typical, Mr. Crystal, is this farm that we have just seen of most Soviet collective farms? It's uh, pretty typical of the Kuban region, which is one of the best regions in the country. Um, the southern Russia. One year out of three has a serious drought. Uh, they obviously have some irrigation. This would be among the wealthiest, uh, without extreme wealth, of the Soviet agricultural areas. Typical in that they get they earn a wage and they also get a percentage of the produce uh, that they grow. Apparently, that's typical of collective farms. The farmers receive about 90% of their wages in money and about 10% in grain. And the grain is used to feed the animals. Those small gardens aren't big enough to grow grain, and they get the grain from the collective. And so the hogs and the chickens are fed in the winter on grain that people earn as part of their wages. What would the wages be? I mean, is it possible to guess, to speculate how much they'd make or not? The but average in 1984 was uh, about... 160 rubles a month. Hmm. And we could translate that a little bit into dollars. It's about the same in dollars, but they don't pay for a lot of things that we pay for. It's like very difficult to calculate, so though, isn't it? Because there's so many hard. extra bonuses built in, so much payment. Like the free time. lunch that the uh, um, man got. That's right. There are sort of all these benefits on the side that, that probably the total would come to rather more than that if you took everything into account. A lot more than that. But this family was able to afford, they mentioned being able to go on vacations occasionally. They bought this very expensive car. How typical is well, that? The farm had some kind of a deal with the resort where they might uh, pay less than if they went alone. The combine operator is one of the most highly paid people in the Soviet Union because how much he loses from that combine that's built on the ground is very important. Uh, his technical ability has to be great. Uh, yeah, they could buy cars, they can go to the resort, they don't have a great deal to spend in for consumer items, and so they can take vacations to Moscow or Odessa or Sochi. Co combine operators are top dogs. <clears throat> Uh, partly because of the quality of the work, but also because they can go into the city and get a job, and they are mobile, so that the you farms mean really want job. to keep you mean them. A moonlighting, or, you mean, you or mean just later. leave farming. Oh, they could go into the city to live, and the farms uh, train about three combine operators for every one that stays. These people truly them. seem not to mind anymore not being able to own their own land. I mean, they at least they. You know, they said, we own the land right around our house, but we can't picture ourselves outside of a collective. Is that a fairly true picture well, of how most see, people feel? Uh, under the previous uh, Tsarist government, uh, not too many of the peasants owned their own land. It belonged uh, to the landlord, and so they're perfectly aware that somebody else owns the land. And in fact, they, <clears throat> the gentleman is right, uh, they look on the land just next to their house as though it were theirs, when in fact they know that they're renting it. I think they see the impossibility of this machinery and the fertilizer and the chemistry and the 
management and all those things which come from outside is absolutely essential to the easier life they're leading now. Mm -hmm. Was what Stalin did truly as devastating as what we heard described there in terms of forcing people to move? Uh, into it was devastating. Several million people were killed or died from the famine, and it was very, a, a devastating, terrible event. It's said that Stalin commented to Winston Churchill during World War II that collectivization to him, Stalin, was worse than World War II. And of course, World Looking War II was devastating to the Soviet yeah. Union, too. So he felt he had made a mistake. And they had thugs, I think, who carried out the program. That happens in revolutions, that thugs get in and and carry things further, perhaps, than was intended by the leaders. But no, it was a devastation, no doubt about but it. But overall, they, they seem to be accustomed now to the system, to the collective system. Is that Yes, fair? I think so. I think so. And I think they wouldn't know how to behave in a private agricultural system. You have to remember, I think, that having a collective system gives a great sense of security. Mm. I mean, whatever may go wrong, they're covered in some way. It's like, it's like a kind of overall insurance. Someone else will take the responsibility. And to many people who don't have a tradition of owning their own land, that is quite a comforting thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's the security that's very appealing. And they never had the traditions of uh, private ownership. They never had a land title system, for example. The sense that I think many of us have of Soviet agriculture, though, is that they've had real problems there over the last few years, and we don't see that here. I mean, just what is it? What's the picture like overall? They've had great problems. Uh, first of all, they, they don't have enough rainfall compared to American agriculture. Uh, but secondly, they've advanced so swiftly with uh, easy things to do, fertilizer and and uh, genetics that they're now coming to the point where they need management and refrigerated transportation and quality control and things which a sophisticated agricultural economy demand and they're a lot more expensive than what they have done in the past they're putting thirty percent of their of their budget into agriculture how much of that can they stand for how long a time so where does that leave them well even roads we saw a lot of dirt roads here mm -hmm. And the road system in the Soviet Union is badly developed in rural areas. Krasnodar has the very rich agriculture, and it's accompanied by lots of rural roads. Much of the Soviet Union has fairly decent agriculture, but the product doesn't get into the cities because they don't have the roads and the transportation, the refrigerated storage. Overall, how, do, how does one compare the productivity of the Soviet agricultural system to what we have in the States? Far beneath. Uh, ours, and uh, they lost between the farm and the table is maybe in excess of 20 percent uh, because of their inadequacies. Um, you mean in terms of transportation? It, well, all kinds. They lose it at the combine and they lose it at the at the processing plant. Uh, it's um, it's far behind ours, but it is successful when compared to themselves. They're feeding more people a better diet with fewer workers. Than they did in, they in did Granny's 20, 25 time, for years example, ago. and what we absolutely. Mm -hmm. How much of a difference <coughs> can Gorbachev make in that respect? I mean, you knew him when he was uh, from the time back when he was. Uh, He's a different sort than his predecessors. He's self-confident. Uh, he understands, I think, clearly the vision of where he wants the Soviet Union to be. How does he get from here to there? Uh, which is a, which is a problem for all kinds of leaders. I think that if he can. If he can bring the things about, the changes about, uh, <clears throat> before he sort of uh, atrophies, that uh, he will be very successful and that we'll see a, a better and I think therefore more peaceful Soviet Union. Atrophies meaning before he, he just gets tired of bumping into the bureaucracy, is that right? Before the bureaucracy gets... learns how to stop him. Mm. But it, would you say that he understands agriculture better than his predecessors because of his background necessarily or? Um, he understands it at least as well as those people. Agriculture is much more important to the Soviets than it is to mm -hmm. us. Have there been any changes because of Gorbachev so far under, I mean, in, in the agricultural arena? I mean, have there, has there been an improvement in productivity? Has there, uh, the record's too brief to tell whether the productivity is up, but there certainly have been some organizational changes and some moves around of people and of technology, that sort of thing. We'll, we'll have to wait to see whether that's going to be successful. I might comment that Soviet agriculture 
does suffer from droughts. They also have are, are at a latitude that's much further north that from what we have. For example, their most southern region is about the equivalent of Denver, Colorado. They don't have the southern uh, tier of states that we have that provide very productive agriculture, particularly Southern California. Question about Chernobyl. In the aftermath, of course, of the nuclear disaster there, we heard that there was a, a real loss of agricultural uh, area productivity. How much of a loss is that going to be for the Soviets? Can we know at this point? It was a trivial loss in the overall picture because it was probably less than 1%. It was, mm. of course, a catastrophe, but the loss of agricultural product was not... Is, it won't affect important. the overall picture very much. Then. No. The lifestyle of these people, and in terms, they, they talked about the concern that the younger people are moving, may move away, they may not stay on the... What, how do you see that evolving? What's the picture in terms of the family structure? There's the a farm? depopulation going on, and uh, they are afraid of it. The best and the brightest uh, go to the bright lights, and how do they keep them down on the farm? They're doing it with all kinds of cultural activities, and I think uh, with some success. But I have friends who are well-placed in the bureaucracy who see it as a real problem, of uh, this uh, kind of depopulation for exactly the opposite reason as ours. Uh, they're being drawn off the farm, whereas ours are having to leave the farm. Are they able to keep the young people there? I mean, are they having any success so far? Yes, either? just recently, just oh. in recent years. It was a paradox we noticed on, on the particular farm that we filmed about whether the young people would go or not, because on the one hand, the farm director told us that education was getting better on the farm, there were better schools, better facilities, but the very fact that they educate the young people better means that they're, they're more likely to want to leave, to carry on their education, to get more skilled professional jobs in the towns. And so they were almost fighting against themselves. Back to the religion question a minute. Um, Granny, of course, talked about her desire to, to go to church. She goes to church, the older generation goes, the younger don't. How do the authorities deal with that? They didn't let your crew film at the church and the graveyard, but in general, how do they deal with that in the collective farm? And in the cities, the churches had a lot of young people. The official religion in the Soviet Union is atheism, mm -hmm. and children are taught atheism in the schools and universities. But as our teenagers rebel against religion, I think some of their teenagers rebel against atheism and turn to the churches. And when I've been to churches in Moscow, there have been a number of, of younger people attending church, and these people often baptize their children. It's, um, it's, it's popular among some of the intelligentsia to go to church and to follow along with the church. They don't follow the old social customs. I noticed that the grandmother's heads were covered, and mm -hmm. that's an old, old Russian custom that mature married women cover their heads always when they're outdoors. And we could see that women my age, for example, don't cover their heads. Mm -hmm. But the, the uh, old social customs maybe will die out, maybe not. And those are religious-based. Mm -hmm. But the religion is, is not, you're, is your, you're saying, is hardly confined just to the older generation. I, I wouldn't say that, no, no, I mean, I would, have, I, I would say it's not confined to the older generations, and it's a, it's a bit of a toss-up on where it's going to go. What's the future, uh, Mr. Crystal, for the collective farm in the Soviet Union? What, what, what lies ahead of the next few years? Well, I think the American question is whether uh, they have to follow the Hungarian or Chinese experiment and, and go back to a kind of free enterprise farming. I don't think the Soviets for an instant will do it. Uh, I think it, uh, on the Chinese part, it was simply going for instant production for long-range problems. I think the Soviets need to <clears throat> spend billions of rubles in agriculture. I think they will uh, lessen the number of people on the farm. Uh, they need to introduce some kind of responsibility, something uh, uh, giving, um, in a way, the stick and the carrot. And do you uh, think they'll do these things? And I think that they, I think it uh, is the desire of Gorbachev, perhaps the stick is a word that he wouldn't use, but uh, somehow to deprive people of luxuries if they do not perform. Well, John Crystal, Professor Elizabeth Clayton, thank you both for being with us. Alan Bookbinder, thank you once again. Next week on Comrades, a rare look inside the world of movie making in the Soviet Union. This is Dinara Asanova.
She's a Soviet feature film director. A woman driven by her art, finding a way to mix important social messages with the required state positions in her films. The program is called Leningrad Movie. It is next week on Comrades. I'm Judy Woodruff for Frontline. Good night. Stay with us now for the premiere of A Planet for the Taking, next on Channel 7. For a transcript of this program, please write to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. For video cassette information about this program, write to Films Incorporated, 1213 Wilmette Avenue, Wilmette, Illinois, 60091. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for this special Frontline series was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. A companion book entitled Comrades, Portraits of Soviet Life is published by Plume Books and is available in bookstores and libraries nationwide. This is PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.